Hello everybody, my name is Dave Stevens. I'm here to talk about your cheat sheet to learning containers, learning about containers and con Kubernetes. Uh, if you've been watching any of the keynotes online this week, you will see that there's a lot around Kubernetes today. Uh, I can tell you that there, if you want to do it from scratch, setting up uh, your first Kubernetes cluster is a, uh, a lesson in futility. It uh, can be very frustrating and uh, some of the things I've seen in the keynotes this week makes that much easier. And if you really think that Kubernetes is going away, uh, you are sadly mistaken. Uh, just like in the old days, that, you know, we had virtual machines and they started multiplying by like rabbits because people didn't need to spend a lot of money on physical hardware and get that purchased and go through the whole rigmarole of getting that done. I can tell you that containers are going to replicate even faster than virtual machines did. Containers are rising in adoption within organizations today, and they're, they're very cost effective, and I'll get a little bit more about why they're cost effective and, and why they uh, are starting to replicate uh, across your infrastructure very fast. If we go back to the day like I was talking about, we have physical hardware. You usually only put one physical application on that hardware, and then we went to virtual machines or a hypervisor where VMs then started scaling across that individual hardware. Well, when you get to containers, the operating system, that's slightly different from, from a, uh, a virtual machine, the operating system is not contained inside the container. And I'll show a graphic to, to really com compare and contrast the two. Uh, oh, and, and last thing, uh, the lifespan of a virtual machine at, uh, or, or a container, look at the very bottom. Uh, containers spin up and spin down really, really fast. You're not going to get a virtual, our virtual machines today spin up uh, pretty fast, but there's usually some other software inside them that takes some time to get up and running. So it's powered on really quickly. Well, it turns out when it comes to a container, it gets powered on and it's pretty much active and ready to run and almost immediately. So why is container adoption growing so much in, in the organizations today? Well, as you see on here on the slides, there's improved application quality and reduced defects from them because people are able to, uh, to spin them up real fast. It's more of a CI, CD pipeline process. If you don't know what that is, that's uh, a development process. I'm not a developer, but I can tell you that trying to just learn about this stuff, you're gonna hear a lot about CI, CD, so I, I suggest you look some of that up. There's reduced application downtime. A lot of the applications, it's not as simple as taking a single, like in the old days, we took a, a physical machine, we did P to V in order to turn it into a virtual machine. When it comes to containers, you can't just take an app and turn it into a container. If you want to start, take the advantages of containers there are today, you need to rewrite portions of your application in order to take advantage of the scale and the speed at which you can deploy them inside your environment. And then there's uh, the, the employee improved productivity. I'm not so sure uh, how, if I really agree with that, but there is faster response to market changes because they're, they've taken an application and they basically split it up, if you want to think of it in terms of layers, they can just work on an individual layer or a piece of, of, a, of, of a larger application and just change that and then take any containers that are based off of those little pieces and shut down what they have running and bring it back up and, all of a, and, and immediately they've got a brand new version of the application running. Uh, if any of you are Slack users out there, this is exactly how Slack works today. It's all based off containers. Uh, they, it's easier to innovate as well uh, and, and there's lower operational costs because it's not a big monolithic app that's typically running inside a container. It's just a little piece of an overall monolithic app that, that, that we're all used to seeing today. And then if you don't believe me and you didn't hear and, and you don't believe the, what you heard today in the, or the last two days in the keynotes, well, these are numbers that are showing you that container adoption is growing and growing and, and this is pretty linear. Uh, I'm sure we'll continue to eventually hit some sort of hockey stick and it will take off and, and really, to really increase inside people's organizations. So, and this is just another view of uh, a, a similar one to show you just where uh, containers are really taking off. Uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone has heard of AWS. If you're not, you're living in a hole somewhere. Uh, but here's, here's some information around all the other providers out there where containers are running. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have anything that, that talks specifically about VMware or uh, vSphere in here. 
Uh, but that's what we all heard over the last two days at the keynotes. So you can see that uh, it's really taking off on premises, but it's, uh, it's really taking off more inside the clouds out there. And so if you were to add these all up, uh, containers are, are just, just getting started inside our organizations. So this is where I'll get into the, the meat of how to compare and contrast a virtual machine to a container. So we all know, we're all, all familiar with VMware products. We've got the infrastructure down below. There's the physical infrastructure, the physical networking, the physical servers that our virtual machines run on. Uh, obviously the hypervisor then where the virtual machines run. But where it really starts changing is at the, uh, at the, the VM level and the container level. You'll see in the, the picture up here that all of our virtual machines have an operating system, which means we need to keep those patched all the time. In addition to the applications themselves to figure out what kind of security vulnerabilities there are for applications out there. And the difference is with containers, because they're really small pieces of an overall larger application that's running, they share the underlying operating system. So they're, if they need an operating system call, then they will make that call back down into the overall operating system or the, the runtime where that's running. And you'll see Docker here is usually the runtime that's running inside uh, uh, different Kubernetes and containers environments out there. Uh, and then we have obviously have the, the typical applications, binaries, libraries, if you're talking about Windows or, or Linux. Uh, and, and so that's, that's one of the biggest differences is the operating system is basically stripped out of a container. Uh, it's just the application itself. So think of it, uh, I'm, I'm an old Windows guy. Traditionally, you'd have to spin up Windows. You'd have to spin up uh, internet information services in order to fire up a web server. And then if you wanted to have a web app, you'd run it on top of IIS in order to do whatever web application you're building out. Well, it turns out when you come to a container, the whole operating system you don't need to worry about that anymore. You don't need to work, keep keeping that patched up. That's someone else, typically someone else's job, like an operations team that's taking care of that. Uh, you just need to worry about the application layer. Uh, and, and so that, that piece of it is where the, the big difference is for containers. So now I'll zip over quickly to this is a, gonna be a very complicated slide, so I've kind of split it out. This is the this is this things we're used to seeing in here. We'll see on the left-hand side, we've got virtual center, virtual center server. It's our orchestration, our management layer. And then underneath there is the virtual center database that, that keeps track of everything and, and makes the UI work uh, ultimately. And then we interact with that through different management APIs, PowerCLI if anyone's out there, or you can write your own PowerShell uh, code itself and then use native REST APIs to call into virtual center to do things. And then continuing to move over to the right, we've got at the top, we've got the network layer. If you're just looking at an on-premises uh, center, data center, you're typically going to be running something like NSXV. Uh, I'll talk about NSXT shortly. And then you've got different security and storage systems in there. Uh, and then inside the cluster itself, we've got the physical hardware, we've got the d different ESX hosts. Uh, and then behind those ESX hosts are the data stores, the RDMs, if you're still using RDMs. And then on top of there are VMs. And then VMs, depending on what it is you're doing, if, you're using the, if anyone's using the hands-on labs uh, this week, it turns out you're taking a lab. A lab is brought into a, an individual resource pool or a, a V app. And that, those VMs are all collected together. And I'll show you quickly how that relates to, to containers here. Then from there, you've got your vSphere cluster. You've got your HA, your DRS, for stuff moving around to make sure your virtual machines and the apps in there are continually running all the time. Uh, and, and so that's, that's, that helps you kind of understand and kind of level set what it is we all know and utilize today. Well, when it comes to containers and Kubernetes, you've got on the left-hand side, you've got the Kubernetes master. So think of the Kubernetes master as your virtual center server. And obviously underneath the Kubernetes master, you've got this, this process called etcd. Etcd is really what is utilized to have all the, the if you're going to have multiple masters, communicate with one another, and they'll, they'll t communicate through the etcd service. Uh, and typically you're seeing, it's showing here, uh, I didn't show the little guys that are on here, you typically have an operations person or a virtual admin that's utilizing this. Traditionally in the Kubernetes space, it's been DevOps. The folks who are 
traditionally writing applications are the ones that are utilizing containers the most. But as you've seen over this, uh, repeating once, uh, myself once again, so over the last two days, that's, that's going to bleed more and more into our world as virtual admins. So we're going to need to start working more closely with the application and DevOps folks out there. And then continuing to move to the right, I'll start talking about the, the Kubernetes nodes, the Kubernetes cluster itself. So the Kubernetes cluster is uh, equivalent to the, the vSphere cluster. The, that's where all the HA and DRS processes are taking. You don't really, they're not really called that inside the Kubernetes environment or containers infrastructure today. And then you've got pods. Pods are then broken up into namespace. It's kind of how you take a, a group of containers and you group them together so that you can bring up an individual application. So if you wanted to take, going back to my earlier example about running Windows, IIS, and then a web app running on top of there, well, in a container world, what you would have, as we saw in the earlier slide, we have the operating system, so we don't need to worry about that. It's all taken care of. But then we need to move up a level at the web server. So now we'd have an individual web server container. And if it turned out that I started getting over, over capacity on the, those individual web servers that are spun up as containers that can't handle the load, I can easily just spin up more web server containers. That's independent of my application. So now then, at that point, my application is set up such that it'll run on top of all those, all those web servers and scale it out. So I can scale out independently across the infrastructure. So that's really where containers really have a big difference. And then you'll see I've got the nodes, they're equivalent to the ESX host, and then storage is uh, kind of a mishmash right now uh, behind containers. So this is my little summary of the cheat sheet of uh, different technologies that we're all aware of. We've got Virtual Center Server, which is our Kubernetes master. We've got our ESX host, which is our sometimes referred to as an infrastructure node, but typically you're going to hear it referred to as just a node or a Kubernetes node. Then you'll have a resource pool. That could be a pod or a namespace when it comes into the containers world. Then we've got our, our HRDR cluster. That's a Kubernetes cluster. We've got the virtual machines where all of our applications run today. That's a container in the, in the, in the new world going forward. And then I, something I didn't mention, we've got templates. So when you create a template, which is utilized in the, the resources or building for the HLLs, you then uh, spin those up. They sit on there, and that's what gets spun up into a, con uh, a container inside the, your environment. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll end there. Uh, and I appreciate you guys all coming to, to hang out. Uh, if you have any questions, here are my information's on the screen. Uh, I'm active on Twitter, and you can email me directly. So thank